This program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with the City of Eau Claire. This program is simulcast on WRFP LP 101.9. I'll call to order the February 26th meeting of the Waterways and Parks Commission. Uh, first item of business on the agenda is approval of minutes from the January 22nd meeting. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. John and John, and all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the minutes are approved. Uh, second item of business on the agenda is uh, recognition of Tom Fielder. Thank Fiedler, come on. I used to call him this when I was a, I had him as a quiet teacher when I was a kid. Not trying to age you, but I mean, you imagine Jeff Um He was one of my favorite teachers, though. But I have a, I have a resolution for you okay, for your service to the Wildways and Cars Commission. And I'm going to read it, and then uh, certainly would like you to say a few words. <coughs> so resolution whereas Tom Fiedler has served as a member of the Eau Claire Waterways and Parks Commission since June of 2013 and whereas Tom has also served as the vice chairperson of the commission since January of 2016 and whereas Tom has provided the commission and staff with invaluable insight, direction, and background on parks, open space, and waterways related issues and whereas during his tenure on the commission, numerous park and waterways related projects and improvements have been completed by the city. And whereas, Tom has always been an enthusiastic and dedicated spokesperson for the commission and city on park and waterways related issues. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Eau Claire Waterways and Parks Commission and staff acknowledges the time, enthusiasm, and dedication of Tom Fiedler as member of the commission since 2013. Put into the packet, but in, in a presentation, I'm going to 
hit all of those spots and highlight the areas uh, in regards to the project. Are we allowed to clean the door? They're, they're actually going to be shut down here. I can shut it part way. Yeah, we can't close it. Yeah, yeah, yeah open door policy. Okay, it's curious. But they promised us that at 7 o'clock, they leave. <laughs> 7 o'clock. <laughs> okay. So uh, tonight again, <laughs> talking about a project that has been long in the planning. Um, a little history of where we, we've come from. We've got a uh, memorandum of understanding with a, a baseball group that is fundraising for the project. The estimated cost for this project is $3 million. Um, and 1.5 million of that funding is coming from the city. The other 1.5 is being fundraised by the, the, the baseball group. The baseball group uh, is consists of uh, several uh, people from the, the, the community. Mark Faunus is the chairperson of the, of the group. Uh, he's also the American Legion coach. We have uh, members from the Eau Claire Express on there, along with the Eau Claire Cavaliers, and uh, a couple of people that are just baseball enthusiasts that want to be part of the fundraising effort. So um, we can go over the first slide. So. The site improvements that we're looking at are the first and third base bleachers. Uh, history behind those is that they date back to 1964, and if anybody's been on those, you'll you, you know that they're they're aged, and, and we have some safety concerns with it. Um, they were constructed in 1964, have been physically moved each year to the football field in the fall of the year to. Uh, on the visitor side of the field to provide additional seating for the field. Um, so basically two years we take them apart, move them, take them apart, move them uh, in the fall of the year. So it is a, it, certainly it, it's been a wear and tear on the, on the bleachers itself, but also it it's, takes time and effort for us to move that, those all the time. We would be looking at permanent bleachers that will not be moved in the future as part of the project. In addition, the bleachers are not able to accommodate handicapped spectators, nor, they, nor do they offer the comparable viewing that is available to the non-handicapped uh, viewers. Um, the other, the second item is climate controlled restrooms. Um, currently, with the restrooms we have in the grandstand area, we're not able to open those up until well into May. Our baseball season here in Wisconsin starts in April, the middle part of April at Carson Park. Some will say that's probably too early, but unfortunately that's just the way it is in the Northern Climate Baseball Program. You say you have to get out there, and there's many times you're out there and it's snowing. We can't open our restrooms because the concrete over the winter has gotten so cold that we, and we've tried this before, so we've learned through experience is that we will uh, turn the water on and it freezes because of the concrete is so cold, the ground around it where the water surface is, is so cold that, and you're not using that water all the time. I mean, you would have to continually run it to make sure it doesn't freeze, but that's what happens. So we can't open up our restrooms uh, so the spectators have to use porta johns uh, during that time of year. So part of this project is to have controlled climate restrooms and, and basically that, that really addresses another issue is that uh, we lack the adequate number of ADA accessible restroom facilities at the, at the stadium. So this is something that we're going to address with, with, along with the climate control. Uh, concessions, we're going to be adding some other concessions areas. So you can imagine if we can't turn on the water for the restrooms, we can't turn on the water for concessions either. So during those times of their early games during April, typically what happens, and I know this from experience, moms will come out there and set up a table and they'll, they'll sell some things for people that are out there. Um, but we have a concessions if, if we have a, an ability to have some heat and water in there, we can actually sell concessions during the game. So the proposed project 
that we look at here will address all these deficiencies. The other areas that uh, we'll be adding is a pair of sales area. Uh, uh, certainly we have two larger programs that, uh, that sell apparel, the Express and the uh, Eau Claire Cavalier, so we'll be providing an area for that. Uh, storage, I mean, you can never have enough storage, and that's another uh, area that we would be adding underneath the bleachers. I'll, I'll show you a little bit of where that area will be so you'll understand, but it gives us the ability to have some storage area under the bleachers. And then the new new dugouts, um, currently the the dugouts we have now, um, they're, they're small. They, they really can't fit all the players that are on the team, so what you have, you have a lot of the players' managers sitting outside of the of the dugouts during games, and it becomes really a safety issue that they're all basically in the field of play during during a baseball game. This the new bleachers are are the ones that we looked at and modeled after is actually after the. Uh, in Appleton at the Fox City Stadiums, and that's where the uh, Timber Raiders play. And they also have the state baseball tournament there every year, but it's modeled after those bleachers there. And they're basically <coughs> large enough to uh, have the entire team within that uh, area, so they're not on the field. And then certainly, uh, because we don't have the water and sewer uh, to these new areas, we'll have to extend the water and sewer. To those areas. Uh, um, basically, the is there a slide before you say it? Um, looking at the, the site layout, and I think it's very important to know that the, the bleach area, you know, I'll get up and talk about this. I have a pointer here, but those pointers don't work on the two TVs. Mm -hmm. so. Um, the extent of the, the project is, are these dashed lines. So this is where basically the project will extend. And important to note, this area here are the historic grandstands of the field. They will not be impacted by this at all. There's no work being done in this area at all. It'll be just the areas around it. This would be the, the uh, First base uh, bleachers, first base dugout, third base dugout, third base bleachers, and then this area here is where we have to extend the water and sewer. So that these areas will be in, uh, impacted. Also, we'll be looking at extending out the fence area a little bit, bringing it up uh, towards the this parking lot a little bit more. Um, I got a few other notes to talk about. So, no zoning will be required as part of the project. It's already zoned as P public. Uh, ADA access to the area, the plaza area, site access, building, and bleacher access are all designed with ADA accessible grades. The reconstruction areas are paved, improving the overall accessibility of the plaza and bleacher areas from the existing conditions. A total of eight trees will be removed from around the stadium for the for the building and site utility construction. Our parks division will replant the trees as appropriate. Once the site is restored and replaced the, remo the removed trees, previous areas disturbed for construction will receive topsoil and reseeded with lawn seed mix once final grades have been achieved. Areas with steep slopes will also receive erosion mats to prevent any erosion in, in those areas until the seed is established. A chain link fence around the perimeter of the plaza will be installed with the same fabric screen material that is currently used around the rest of the stadium. The new, as I mentioned before, new water service and sewer service will be extended. And then the trash uh, enclosure will include a new dumpster pad and a screening fence near the ADA parking stalls, which are down in the, uh, off the first base side of the area. Next slide. So looking at a couple of conceptual designs here. Um, 
The, the project will consist of two new permanent bleacher structures and will provide an accessible, unimpeded viewing area for up to 38 wheelchairs. Currently, right now, if you've been out to the field, there's an area on the first and third base side that probably can accommodate maybe three or four. So this will bring us in well into compliance and, and give a, uh, a viewing area for people that are challenged uh, with being in a wheelchair or, or needing to be in an area where they can be uh, more accessible to that. They'll give them an area and also you can see there's an area for a, uh, uh, someone else to be there with somebody that they're in a wheelchair, that they a, co a companion to be with them. Okay. This is looking at the, uh, the front view from the, from the field. Uh, the project consists of the two, uh, two new bleacher structures and we'll see 456 non-handicapped spectators on each side. Um, and I mentioned on each side of the it would be approximately 19 for wheelchair accessibility for a total of 38. The, the bleachers will consist of a vacuum with individual plastic seats and we'll be looking at these stadium seats. So there will be a backrest on them. Uh, gives a little bit more of a uh, customer experience and, and uh, certainly uh, we know from, from experience the fans like that a little bit better to have some bank support. Pro protective guardrails will run along the perimeter of the seating area. The guardrails will be painted green and infilled with matching green vinyl coated chain link mesh. An ADA accessible ramp. And you can't see it so much on here. You can see it from the other, but the ramp will be coming up on, on these sides from on the, near the grand side. will come up here. So it will come up. So some of the road we have a little bit uh, more um, uh, designed. The current ones we have were, were put in there because we needed them. This will be designed with the, the bleachers in mind. And then the dugouts will be replaced with the new larger concrete dugouts that provide additional space for seating and equipment. I mentioned that before, but if you've ever been in there or had any kids that played ball, they'll tell you that it's pretty packed in there. You don't have much room to, and that's why most of the kids uh, sit outside. This is looking at the, the back of the picture. And again, you can see this is all encased. The, the bleacher system itself, it's aluminum decking and it's waterproof. So anything that falls on there, anything snow, rain, it's not going to get down into the um, into this area that's below it. And that was one of our concerns. And we, we took a great deal of time with picking the right uh, uh, manufacturer to make sure that <coughs> this was a system that wasn't going to leak. Because we're going to be putting infrastructure in here. And we're going to have concessions, we're going to have restrooms, we're going to have storage, and we're going to have apparel areas. So we want to make sure that there wasn't any leaking. So it's, it's a system that has been proven and, and um, I, they've been in business for a long time. And <clears throat> I'll have Rival, we have uh, Rival back, back to Laris. Here. And he's, he's here and he can answer some questions once I'm done. And, um, but, we really researched this to make sure we had a good manufacturer that we weren't going to have you know, put it in and then all of a sudden have leaking problems on this uh, continuously. So the, the sides and the back of the bleachers will be uh, enclosed with rock face concrete block wall that will generally match the color of the existing grandstand building, but not to make it look exactly like it. There's a reason for that. We don't want it to be perfectly a match for it. We want it to complement it. But because the grandstand is a historical site, we want to make sure that there's a, you can look at it and say, well, I can tell this was built in a different time period as what the, the grandstands were. So there's a reason for that. Uh, this enclosure not only conceals the supporting structure underneath of the bleachers, but also creates an enclosure for other amenities 
such as the, the restrooms and the, and the concessions, as I had mentioned before. So what will this uh, entail here? We'll have two ADA accessible restrooms, each with seven sanitary fixtures and a diaper changing table. You see the restrooms down towards the right area. Um, a 500 square foot preparation area serving window for concessions. <coughs> you can't see that, but that's on the far side around there. There's actually another window for the concessions and an entryway to get into the, into the concessions area. And that will be something that we can, again, another climate controlled area that we can open up earlier in the season. A 300, foot, uh, a 300 square foot uh, retail area for apparel sales. A secure condition storage for our IT equipment required for scoreboard operations security cameras. And then a secure storage for some of our ground maintenance equipment and materials. And then all the exterior lighting provided as part of the project is per our City of Eau standards, including the full cutoff of the features. Um, the windows, you can see we, we tried to match, you know, we were looking at grabbing some of the, uh, the recent uh, construction of some of the major league baseball fields where they incorporated some old building structure into some of their uh, ball fields. And so we added some windows. Again, they're, they're useful because they do provide light uh, into these areas uh, during the day. We also put uh, you know, lighting around the uh, facility for you know, to light it up. One, it's going to give it some ambiance, but it also will give us some security so we can see if there's anybody uh, in the area that's not uh, you know, doing something they shouldn't. Again, this will be all within the, in the fenced area, so it will be, you know, what it was going to say. We've already gone through the Landmarks Commission and seek approval, and we've sent off to the State Historical Preservation that, uh, and they've given their approval to the project. And that was at our February 10th meeting. And with that, I'd be happy to answer questions. Like I said, we do have Rival. He's our main designer. If you want to come up and say a few words, we can. Uh, well, I guess I'm doing any slides. Any sure I can maybe just answer questions. Okay. Really. I don't get any slides of the plans or anything. I think we have some. Uh, it's part of the packet. But yeah. let's see if there's any questions. Yeah. We have to go there. So. so, any questions? Yeah. <coughs> Actually, yeah, if you wouldn't mind just going for the yeah. point of the LCA letter right there. Yeah, I'm sorry, could you just uh, state your name again in your organization? Uh, Rival Balchunas with Ayers Associates. Okay, thank you. Good job. Yeah, I really like the plans, but uh, it seems like the dugouts are moving closer to the outfield than, than home plate. Um, as far as baseball goes, you know, most people like to be closer to home plate. They don't seem to have any other uh, connection with the new building, so I don't know if it's possible to move them in a little closer to home plate. I think we had some issues with um, is he kind of getting a little too close. Actually, they are pretty close, Garrett. I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. This is Garrett Price. Yeah. 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 Garrett uh, Shambo. He's our civil engineer. He kind of developed the size of that. Yeah, I'm like Garrett Shambo. I'm civil engineer also with Ayers and. Uh, what we actually did is we did keep the closest corner to home plate right in the exact same spot as the existing dugouts are. So you can see this. You know, this is actually the existing uh, kind of the existing uh, um, concrete area you crawl under right here on both sides. It's a little funky stretch because it is actually symmetric. But on both sides, the, the dugouts, as far as proximity to home plate, are in the, uh, the same general location. And we did have some discussions about it because actually. At Carson Park, both the back, backstops and the dugouts are um, maybe closer than they, it's not required, but the recommended distance from home plate for, for clear space around home plate uh, that will maybe necessarily be recommended if you're building a brand new facility. So I, uh, I would say they're, they're not further away. They're getting longer, which is maybe what makes them feel like they're further yes. away. They're getting significantly longer, but the, the inside corner proximity to home plate is in the same location. I would get some more input on that from, from the coaches. 
And that may, that's not stretched properly. So you can see there, there's actually, it doesn't look symmetrical because it looks like the third base is squished down and the first base is a little bit wider. So it was just primarily to get this in the screen. So. Yeah, they, 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 yeah, the dimensions are identical oh, otherwise. Yeah, so there's, yeah, so yeah, it doesn't you can see that. longer this way. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you can see the lettering is all stretched out this way, but yeah, they're all the same. They are a little bit longer this way um, than the old dugouts were, as Jeff had mentioned in his presentation, just to have more room. Um, and I guess, you know, the Express and the Cavaliers and uh, others have reviewed the design of the dugouts and they're satisfied with it. They looked at it. They're okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Susan? So I was having trouble with the things we had in our packets because I couldn't visualize the relationship to the historic um, stadium. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't in the in the picture on my screen at home. I couldn't get it. So Pat kindly sent me some additional pictures so I could really see it and you can see how nicely it would complement and not interfere. Is there any risk to the historic structure from just being in the middle of a construction, pretty large construction site? No, I mean, it's, um, there's not a lot of really deep excavation that's gonna occur anyway, or any sort of thing that's gonna sort of undermine the soil. And there's sort of that sort of construction so you can a lot of vibration or anything. So, uh, no, I really don't believe so. And then I, I understand you're wanting to make the contemporary structures complementary, mm -hmm. not trying to match them mm -hmm. as though you were pretending they were historic. But the, um, in the picture, it looks like there's the trim is all kind of park bench green, mm -hmm. but that's not the color of the stadium, is it? It's kind of more that teal. That it's painted. Will they will they match that up? The colors. Colors. Yeah. Good good question. That, that is a future project that we plan on with the uh, stadium. The, uh -huh. the where the wood we have, we'd be looking at uh, repainting that because we have some issues within the grandstand right now with uh, some uh, water leakage going into where the uh, the, the ball players. Uh, locker rooms are. So we have to take care of that. So we have to address that issue. And at the same time, we are going to do a painting of the, the current facility. Trim. Yes. That came up at the Landmark Commission. They had the same question. The, um, I don't know if there's ever been a paint analysis, you know, to try to figure out what the original stadium was like. But I thought it would be nice if we could match. I, I don't yeah. think people would mistake this for a historic structure, but they could, the trim could match. Yeah, if you see where baseball historically, some of the, the fields used to have that same color we have now, and now they're changing. They're changing to uh, other colors, and it doesn't seem like there, there's a specific color to each stadium. No, I'm thinking of the color that the stadium was in 1937. When it was first painted, I don't know if, knows we could, what that was. if we could chip down on <laughs> some of the, the old painted structures. It probably it can be done. <laughs> um, What's the schedule on how long would this be uh, commissioned? Well, my basically, uh, we uh, bidding this product, assuming we get approvals uh, all the way down the line. Uh, we'll be bidding later this spring and getting some numbers back and then if the numbers seem favorable or that the decision made to proceed. And if the construction does proceed, uh, construction will commence in September following the conclusion of the baseball season and that would commission continue through winter. And the idea would be that would be ready again next spring after the game so there really wouldn't be any eruption of the baseball season. Um, money been raised by the other group? Yes. It's all they're, they're fundraising. They've been fundraising. Uh, but is it all? Since? Pardon me? Is it all? Is the 1.5 million? No. So that it's all kind of contingent on that? Uh, 
it's contingent upon what they they fundraise. I mean, our hope is that they get to the 1.5, and the mm -hmm. city's already appropriated our 1.5. So the hope is, uh, and we have worked out some other options if, if for some reason we can't build this out completely with the funding we have. Um, but right now, the, the goal of the group is to raise their 1.5 in, in cash and donations. And they can also have pledges up to 10 years. Um, I, I believe at the, the last uh, meeting we had, they, they, they were looking at uh, somewhere in the neighborhood still needing about 800,000. So they're about half of it. John? Is that on this project, is planning to is planning to put any like saving energy light on in, onto this? Well, the, uh, basically for codes, you, you, you have to basically be energy compliant at this point. Uh, but certainly, yeah, we have uh, you know, efficient light fixtures, um, water saving, um, you know, plumbing fixtures. Mechanical systems are sized to um, uh, basically operate uh, in, in a manner that you know they're uh, you know they're, they're they're time sensitive, so that you know they're not getting any sort of waste. You know, uh, you know, shut they shut off automatically when you know not in use and so the fans and stuff in the restrooms and so on. Um, uh, yeah, that yeah, the, they're. Again, the ventilation systems and so on are also high efficiency. So yes. <clears throat> How much bigger is the Finston area than it is already now? Like if I'm looking at this one, I just wonder, like, how much more is the park? It's really on this on the first base side that we would see the fence. The fence is right there. Be coming here and going out here. Right now, that fancy, I, mean, I don't think it's on the right here. So yeah, that, that fee that she doesn't show it, I'm trying to call up one of the other sheets that I have in the packet. Might do you, show the you be able to pull up one of the other sheets on the packet? It's not that particularly that? obvious on. Oh, I can even see. So it does see it does show me on this one then, where the dark is where yeah. it would the so edge the, the dark space. kind of space. Yeah, looks like that there was a call. I think it, I landscaping think the one comes in through here. I, it's hard to tell on the Yeah. Sheet. Well, you can so I guess you can see it on the third base side pretty well by where the existing. Well, I guess on both sides you can see on the north where the existing fence look. It, it does continue straight. And it, it jogged it does, you know, uh, from, the, from the north limit up there. The current, uh, just to the right of the axis, that's, that's the existing fence. Mm -hmm. The current one extends straight and it does start to jog back out as you get closer to the main grandstand. You can kind of do the same exercise over on the other side. <coughs> and that's where the, 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 the tree removes come. These, things, these new leaves are, the structures themselves are a fair bit. I don't know the exact number, but are in that 15 to 20 foot, I would say, deeper as far as the structure themselves and where the existing bleachers. Is there going to be any like land filling in? Because isn't there a pretty significant drop off, especially right on this side? There's a third mm -hmm. base side. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's why you'll see the, the construction limits go all the way to the bottom of the sidewalk. The, the grades are where they're really actually quite steep, is south or, oh. or uh, lower than their limits. So there are still there's some. Decent grades here, but the sidewalk trail is coming up as it goes to the football field, so those grades are getting more gradual. But in general, we limit ourselves to a three to one slope, which is still fairly steep, but very common, kind of, and best engineering practices slow. So we will be regrading those and um, reshaping that. That's where the steep slopes are, which are nasty, kind of, that establishment is where it comes in. Uh, regarding the restrooms um, that are being installed, are there any? Um, Family friendly or gender neutral bathrooms included in this plan? They're not gender neutral, but they are. There are uh, diaper changing tables provided for both male and female restrooms. Hmm. 
but nothing like say if a you know a young child with a parent of the opposite gender wanted to go in, nothing that's family friendly where they can go in all together. No. Is there any option for including something like that? You just one stall is available because uh, because we have a lot of small children here who aren't you know, necessarily infants that that could be helpful for the families. Um, I mean, it's involves some redesign at this point, but I mean, it is theoretically possible, so I guess that's the decision that the city would have to make. Yeah. Are there any relations with the city about including family restrooms for facilities? We don't necessarily have a, a requirement of them. We try to have it to where, um, especially with the change details, that's why we put one in each restroom. Right, speaking of myself having a daughter, you know, I've been in a place where it's difficult to use restrooms because you know she's like four or five and dealing with herself being out of gender from her, it's, it's a challenge at times. So, so I would suggest that there's something if possible be considered to facilitate that for families knowing. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good point. I'm kind of surprised it isn't required and I'm, I can foresee what might be required to a number of years down the road. Yeah. Even like there's one, I know there's two bathrooms, maybe, you know, make the men a little smaller and have a standalone entry stall that, you know, could accommodate, um, you know, family members going in together that would do that. You know, all the men are like your also for toilets, and that might be an option if you had like a men's and a women's try to carve out a little bit from the men's room perhaps and mm -hmm. see if you can't have something that's an isolated stall for, for families. Well, yeah, certainly there's, there's opportunities to move space around there to make something like that happen. I guess it's like more you know, question of this and that. Uh, Recommendations. Yeah. So. And I, I'm guessing with the input you had from the baseball interest, the express, and handlers and so on, that they're happy with the dugouts and the access to the locker Yeah, we work very closely with them in terms of what the features are, the dimensions, and it was important to have them in the room with us when we designed and we, we did this because they're, they're fundraising half of us. So. So. Are there any other questions for either Jeff or the members from Ayers? If not, thank you for your information. Thank you for having us. So, uh, then the Motion is the recommendation to approve the Carson Park Baseball Stadium and bleacher improvements. Uh, is there a motion to approve? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, don't forget that. Thank you, member of the public, for asking me. <laughs> Are there members of the public that would like to comment to this? I just have a couple questions. Are there locker rooms with the dugouts connected to the dugouts? No. No. We're, the, the, Locker rooms are in the old part of the stadium, and we'd be looking at uh, refurbishing those at some point because they're, they're the ones that, when I mentioned that we have some leeway right. in the grandstand, that's what's being affected. So, but there's some point that's not part of the plan now to refurbish those. No, but there's a final connection from the locker rooms to the dugouts. You know, on the other side of the beaches. Yeah, because we're not disturbed by that part of the We're the just one other question. Then we uh, we always hear about turf, how the field is going to be turfed at, at some point in time, and how does uh, that project interface with this project? Are they totally separate? And <coughs> how are we with turf for Carson Park? Good question. Um, they are separate projects. Uh, the one thing that we had to do is we had to do the utility work and the dugouts before we do the do the field if we put artificial turf on there. So that will be a, another project in the future. Certainly that's gaining more and more support, especially with the uh, Jimmy O'Claire coming back with baseball. And um, um, we I've had a couple meetings with them already regarding that and that's a that's a that's a big important issue for them because they're, they're playing at the same time that high school's playing. So they need to get their their games in during the time that, when typically we're battling where we can have you know, restrooms open, 
Um, or if it rains, um, or will the field be able to handle, you know, might be two or three games in a day. Right now, it's a challenge for us because of keeping the trip management. So that is a project that is certainly, and it seems that we have a lot of uh, support from not only the university, but the school district and uh, some of the other programs that are interested in uh, helping out with that. Great. That would really seem like a priority to me. Think about how many baseball games are played at Carson Park in a year, now you have the university, and then you're going to be playing at a time when the field's going to get torn up real quickly. Uh, so it seems like terrific to be a priority. Yeah. Any other members of the public? Which of who would like to comment? Seeing none, the uh, motion on the table is the recommendation to approve the Carson Park, Carson Park Baseball Stadium and Bleacher Improvements. Is there a motion to? So moved. John, is there a second? Sure. Kirk? Uh, Can we put in an addition just about what about your comment? Well, no. Yeah, is there any comments, uh, any discussion on the commission about this? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just wonder if we could just say that that's something that came up at uh, our meeting and if they can talk about it at the next one and we can add the bathroom, the accessible family bathroom. Um, I mean, just as a discussion point in the future meetings. We, we can add that as a recommendation. Mm -hmm. would need that? Does none of this recommendation, we need the vote to recommend that? You can make a motion to amend that. Would you, would you, would you, are you I'll make that motion, yes. To attach, to, to recommend the installation of family friendly bathrooms as an amendment to the recommendation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there a second to the motion to the amendment? I'll second. Okay, Susan. Okay, uh, all in favor of the amendment? Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, so the amendment is attached to the recommendation, um, and the recommendation was already seconded, so we can now vote on the full amended recommendation. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the amended recommendation is approved. Second item of new business is recommendation to approve and implement and adopt a park or trail program in the city of Eau Claire. Steve? Excuse me. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, tonight I am in front of you to uh, present a proposal from the class of 2019-2020 leadership of Eau Claire. They want to team up with the uh, Parks and Recreation Department. They were speaking with Julie Brown and Todd last year to enhance our Adopt a, Pro Adopt a Park program. Uh, they want to rebrand the program, which would help encourage groups and organizations to get involved and help to maintain and beautify our parks and trail systems. In addition, it would it would add at least a minimum assist our park staff with the spring and fall cleanups. Uh, this program would be eligible to all parks or trails within the city limits. Uh, they work very hard to brand this program. In front of you, you'll see a brochure, a sample brochure regarding the, the programs of uh, volunteer groups could sign up through our recreation department Julie and they could be business and churches, families, neighborhoods, uh, recreation enthusiasts uh, could all adopt a park. And once they adopt a park they would get a certificate. I believe that was in your packet and we would also we marked up some sample signs that we would put in our park. Uh, City logo, naming the park or the trail that they're on, and then the group that they're sponsored by. We ask for at least a minimum of a, a two-year commitment. Uh, they would need to fill out an application, and whenever they volunteer, uh, they would fill out a, a volunteer form to turn into dueling codes to show how many people volunteered and how much garbage or trash bags they collected. At the end of the year, we would, would like to report that, say, we have 600 volunteer hours in our parks with a ton and a half trash collected or 500 bags of trash. 
to get people involved and to let them know we really appreciate their work. Uh, we have beautiful parks in the town and there's a lot to maintain and any bit of help we can have in our parks department we greatly appreciate. I have Chris and Lindsay uh, from the Eau Claire leadership uh, group that actually initiated this program and if you have any questions or Chris or Lindsay would like to speak uh, you're more than welcome to. Chris or Lindsay would they think that's at this point or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no I think actually you did a great job. We teamed up on this starting last fall with Jeff, it was kind of his idea, we kind of helped run with it. We actually did a lot of research on other communities that have this type of program, and we kind of went through um, like Colorado Springs and the city of Woodbury, Minnesota, and we just kind of plucked the things that we really liked about each of their programs, because there's so many of these programs out there, is that that's what we pulled from. Is, so we copied a lot of what we liked from others and brought it in, kind of incorporated and made our made our own program for this. So, and then our, a lot of our help do that, so. Can I get your full name, please? Christopher Gaffney, it, it was really great working with this uh, group of uh, leadership of the class. Uh, for both Chris and Lindsay uh, did a great job. We had several meetings with them. Um, this was really, the culmination of the work they did. Um, working with them, so it was a collaboration with us, but certainly they did a lot of work with us. And, and I forgot to mention the one uh, great element of this program is we have a full time recreation staff that would initiate and run the program. Uh, you would need to contact her, Julie, to start all of the, the she would coordinate the parks, the trails, so there's no overlap. Uh, we would have a volunteer coordinator helping with this program. Uh, Susan. Um, I thought that idea was a really nice extension, potentially, of the success of the cleanup days mm -hmm. and something more that people could do a way they could be involved in the parks, which everybody is, regards as very important. And the only thing I thought about it was it seemed kind of like the paperwork was pretty heavy, like you have to sign a waiver every time you go and things like that. Um, nothing will tell you whether it's too heavy or not, like doing it for a while. But did you talk about how much paperwork would be I actually just did the this one I have it here too. It says adopters must complete the city of Eau Claire volunteer service liability waiver agreement prior to every work day. So like every month when they would go out, they have to complete the paperwork again. Is there no way to just have it for one per season perhaps? It's it's in the proposed adoption agreement policy item three. That's part of our risk management requirement. So we work with our risk management, our legal department, but. Remember, we have a volunteer coordinator that would be helping with that. So we're, we're going to try to make it as less onerous as possible. So it's not something that's going to have groups look at and say, geez, I don't want to take care of that. We're going to actually have a staff member really leading through that and probably do a lot of the stuff ahead of time. All they have to do is check off. And, and that, the check off part is, is the risk management part that our risk management says we need to when you say adopters, it would just be the organizer of the group, or would everyone working have to also complete the form? Um, do you guys remember that? Was that each member, or was it just the, the organization? Um, I think there might be a list where you got to put down whoever's there. It might be just one person signing off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's just the one person. So I can tell you that there would be a lot of them. If it's, you know, on some of these groups that have already come on, and they do some of our cleanup, especially with uh, amazing old player cleanup. Excel, you know, so they bring a, a group of people on a maybe volunteer service day that they want to adopt a park or a trail, and they said, okay, we're going out on this day, we're taking our whole team, we're going to go out there, we're going to clean up this park. And the one thing that uh, um, Steve kind of touched on was we're also going to be working with our, our parks uh, maintenance division that they will 
have areas prepared for these groups to go out and, and help us with. So we'll have projects that we'll, we'll know that we need some assistance on. Um, Chris and Lindsay, can you tell us what are some of the pitfalls you learned about when you talk to these people, to the places that have already done it? Is there anything we need to watch out for? <laughs> you know, I can't think of anything that we noticed that was an issue that they ran into. And it was, I mean, every, I mean, a lot of it was we were looking at their websites and what they have and what they've done in the past. And it was quite literally like which items do you like the best and seem to work the best. So, like, um, for instance, City of Woodbury, they had a list of actually all their parks on their website and they actually have them divided up as these ones have already been adopted and these ones say we're looking for adopters for these parks and so they had it right there so anybody was there to come in and take a look they'd see it right there like hey that park needs a needs somebody to help or hey my neighborhood park has nobody adopting that one i want to adopt that park well that person can then easily find that information out real fast so yeah, there's certain things that we definitely did like from all of the different ones that we looked at. So we try to kind of peel back and pull the best items that we liked. So the parks obviously you define as parks, but the 29 miles of recreational trails, how are they actually, are they, are they official starts and ends? Like how would those get cut up into an area that one would adopt? That's a good question. We, we haven't really established that, but we'll look at different trail sections that we can identify. Again, um, part of the project is to put a sign up, so it, it adopts the trail. If you look at part of the trail, adopt the trail was really adopted after the, the, the adopt a highway type mm -hmm. of program. They'll have a section of highway that from here to here, you know, XYZ company is taking care of that. So we'll, we'll look at that. Um, we haven't necessarily divided that up, but that would be something that we'll do it as a department. Okay. Hopefully we have a problem. We got a whole bunch of volunteers that want to come out and be part of this and they sign up. And so if it, you know, we said this about special events uh, years ago when we only had a handful, now we have over 110 last year. So perhaps that will happen. And I hope we said it does happen in that sense. Another question might be um, better for Chris or Lindsay. And in, in the form here, this is, this is really just kind of P's and Q's. It says monitoring of the adopted area must be done once a month between April and October. Is that inclusive, like during April? Would April be the first month and October be the last month? Like, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, do I, I'm, I'm, I'm really new looking here, but yeah, between, which someone was saying, oh, between those May and September. So maybe just think about changing the verbiage to say mm -hmm. during the months, just so people understand. It was a little confusing when I read it, just, uh, it's on that last. In the middle of the page in our adoption agreements, maybe just be clear where it says between April and October. Yep. Just for confusion's sake, so small comment there. Kirk? Yeah, and then on that same uh, paragraph there, I, I just stumbled a little bit on the must be done once a month for all these things. I, I can imagine some. Sometimes those, all those things don't need to be done. You know, washing picnic tables or sweeping hard surfaces or raking leaves, you know. Right. And that's where, we'll, that's where um, the Parks Maintenance Division will come and say, okay, this is, this is really what needs to be done. Yeah. You know, if it's the middle of the summer, typically we're not going to have an issue with leaves at that point. Fall, you know, there should be some issues with leaves. I guess instead of saying must be done, maybe it should be done as needed. Yeah. Something this is a sample. We'll soften it up a little bit. Yeah. 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 We'll yeah. soften it up. We don't want to be so regimented. Just, right. yeah. it was, it's kind of two parts. It includes some of these things that's not going to pertain to all of them. The first part is that they have to report once a month. Any other questions or comments on the proposal? Could you maybe um, adopt part of a park? Uh, you know, say it was a big park. <laughs> um, is that, a, is that yeah. a possibility to take, say, a disc golf course at the Mount Simon or something like that? Sure. Yeah. 
And take Carson Park, for example. I mean, yeah. certainly it'd be hard for one group to say, I'm going to take care of Carson Park, but we've got Birch Pavilion, we've got Pine Pavilion, Oak Pavilion, we've got the playground area, so we can split that up into different areas. Um, and there's a cool thing, is that when you volunteer to do this, you get a sign that signifies that this is your area to maintain. So, yes. Right. Some, some areas might be small enough that one group is you know, no problem. The neighborhood problems, they're small. I just want to say I think it's a, a really good idea and I'm very appreciative that your group has taken that on. And the question I had relative to this project is what kind of other marketing things will you do to let the community know about it? Well, our goal is actually to have it kind of our kickoff will be kind of right around the Great Oak River cleanup. So after we kind of get all of our approvals and you know, all of that, I guess the red, through the red tape part of it is then we definitely have, I work with Jeff and have some kind of media campaign. We, did, we definitely had talked about that. Within our group, we had discussed that, you know, once we were getting through that, the, the, all the approval process of having a, some kind of media campaign. <coughs> yeah, Excuse sure me. We talked about these Facebook and the social medias and maybe a little news article or whatever, so you get, just get the word out, I think that'd be Jeff, would this be listed in the, I don't know what section would be, the, the prime times, like, it could be listed in there, yeah, somewhere or somewhere? Yeah, absolutely. Better. absolutely. Yeah, I would think like buying one on uh, TV press. You wouldn't have trouble I, first. It would surprise <laughs> me once this is publicly noticed, especially when we get the planning commission and city council, that we do get some uh, media attention. On your um, working signs or the signs that you're putting out, if it's if it's said on it, who to contact if you want to adopt a park, because that would probably be the thing that would prompt people. They're already in the park. They see that somebody's doing this. Well, could I do that? How would I do it? If you can get it on the little sign, you mm -hmm. would like brochures, like a place for brochures, underneath. Something that, so you right when the person mm -hmm. is seeing what the possibility is, they could do it. Yeah, on the back of the, well, I think on the front side, you want to keep it nice and good looking, but maybe on the back of the side, <coughs> so you can, you know, to adopt the park or trail, contact this, and that'd be on the sign yet. Hidden little, or a couple of those codes are called, but there's a, a QR code. QR codes. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. The possibility that we could put that on with your phone when it pops up to you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. There's you could do a similar looking sign that says this is park so looking is looking to be adopted. Oh, that's Please adopt. Please adopt. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, wherever the finish line would go, we just have one. Yeah. A movable one. Working park. This one. <laughs> this one's up for adoption. <laughs> I think people will be interested. Whether they'll be interested after they have 500 sacks of trash. <laughs> that will be the test. Well, if I can do two year community. <laughs> <laughs> Any other uh, questions or comments? Um, do we, what are they doing with <coughs> the trash? Pardon? Do we say what they did with, do with the trash? What they would do if there's a large pickup, they would. Keep it in the park, and we would swing around and pick the way it's all. Any other questions or comments? Okay, if none, thank you, Steve. Thank you. Um, is there a motion to recommend the approval and implementation of the Adopted Park or Trail Program? Ooh. Ellen, is there a second? Ron, is there any further discussion amongst the commission? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the recommendation is approved. Next item of business is the 2020 special events list. Well, you can, you can see that uh, we are only have a few special events. The full plunge happened last week. Uh, from all the occasions, it was a success. It was actually a nice day. So. It wasn't <laughs> Last year's got canceled, if you recall, because of too much snow. <laughs> so, 
This year was perfect, so it uh, just happens that way. Um, coming up uh, in March, we got the Shane Mark Shuffle and then the Eau Claire Irish Fest. So, those will be happening. Uh, the Shane Shuffle will be done with some trails and sidewalks around the Eau Claire campus, and then the Irish Fest will be at the Haymarket Plaza and on the sidewalk areas. So, any questions on any of those? That list will start becoming more and more filled in as we move along. Moving along to the director's report. Okay, um, looking at our parks division, uh, we continue to <coughs> the streets, uh, particularly down in the Mount Simon area. Um, where we finished painting the interior wall in the Hops Ice Arena, uh, and then we started maintaining our summer equipment, getting that ready for the upcoming season. Um, actually, we had our, uh, our Kubota uh, uh, piece of equipment break down, so we ended up having to buy a new one to ruin our trails with, so we just received that. Um, we've been repairing our park and historical uh, district signs. Um, uh, we've been flooding six outdoor skating rinks and amazingly enough they're still being used. I don't know how much longer but I'm, I'm guessing within the next couple of weeks that season will pass us once again. Um, so, but uh, certainly you, you'll see at the bottom of the list that we, we, our attendance in our recreational areas are really up this year. Um, and then uh, also we've continued our snow removal of uh, over the 40 miles of sidewalks and trails, including the, the new winter mission trail route that we have. <coughs> it's got a lot of attention and we're doing a lot of use and certainly I've, uh, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback on the trail. And so the trail that we're paying a lot, a little bit more attention to make sure it's very clear so people that want to get out, it's uh, it's not ice covered, not snow covered. It's been very nice. Uh, forestry division, um, we're working with our fire department to burn the two brush piles along the trail on Boyd Park. If you remember, those were the areas that uh, this commission uh, recommended approval for us to clear out some of that area primarily of invasives down on the, on the shoreline. So we're gonna be burning some of those uh, piles X, actually with, uh, with some assistance from Excel and Energy. Um, working with the engineering department to coordinate our spring sidewalk replacement program. Uh, part of that is because of uh, the tree roots in the, in the boulevard sometimes cause heaving of the sidewalk and so it becomes a trip hazard. So we work with our engineering uh, department to coordinate dealing with those uh, shallow road systems. Um, we finished the ash tree removal on the east side neighborhood for the season, not that it's completely done, but for the season. And then and we have been moving to the far west side for removal and trimming uh, right now. Uh, we had some of our uh, folks in, in our forestry division attend an annual winter conference to get some continuing education credits for their certifications. And then we're working with uh, three neighborhood groups uh, for spring planting, uh, Boyd Park, First Avenue planting, and Wold Court uh, planting. Then looking at our rec division, this is something that uh, I, I brought to you uh, a couple of meetings ago, but I wanted to keep you updated about looking at what our attendance has been uh, this year compared to last year. Uh, we've, our total attendance for our rec areas where we have uh, our facilities open for winter activities, we've had over 11,575 attendees. Last year at the same time, we had 5,838. And the one thing that we've really emphasized this year has been uh, our winter mission uh, uh, program. And that has seemed to really energize and you know, 
the, the, the goal of that program is to get people out in the winter time and do things rather than stay inside and uh, end up getting seasonal uh, affective disorder. Mm -hmm. So, if, and you can see now, even now, when the days are getting longer and the sun is getting higher in the sky, so there's a, there seems to be a little bit more enthusiasm in people. So, this is, this is very encouraging when we see uh, these numbers double you know, in, in what they, they have been in the past. So. Well, last year was a very difficult. I won't disagree with that. <laughs> I, I have for to say my, my February was much more enjoyable this year than it was last year. <laughs> we had a lot of sleepless nights. So. Oh. Um, and then uh, just remind you the 2020 spring and summer edition of Prime Times is available. So I have a question about um, the north side Pinehurst? park. Pinehurst? Uh, Pinehurst, mm -hmm. yes. So it has a huge increase. So what were the particular things that, are, is it finally getting some of their amenities done that they've been working on, or, or what really is driving it? Um, Yes, uh, Outdoor War has created a trail that has been very popular, uh, cross-country trail, and uh, also there's a trail that they're using for uh, snowshoe. We're also providing, through the winter mission, uh, equipment for people to try different things at the, at, the, at, the, at the site. So we have snowshoes out there, we have some, I forget all the other amenities we have out there, but you know, we've got the skates, we've got uh, other equipment that they can use to try out while they're on site so they don't have to go somewhere and rent it somewhere or go by and we, they can come up there and try it out right at the, at the, at the site. So that's primarily the other, the other uh, reason is um, we've, we've actually done our our Thursday night, uh, excuse me, what we call it? Uh, uh, winter after hours. Winter after hours, thank you. Um, is out in, at Piners now. It was at Boyd Park, and the, it's now at Piners. So that's another reason why you see much more at uh, Piners. Any other questions for the director's report? If none, I would take a motion to. I did have a. Yes, I have a, wanted a clarification. If I could, if we could go back to the the uh, Carson Park uh, bleachers, your amendment to add a family uh, rest uh, restroom is that for each bleacher building or one family? Just one. Uh, yeah, one specified, but I believe the intent was at least one. At least one. Mm -hmm. If everyone's agreeing with that? Yeah. Okay, that seems to be the consensus. You're saying only one, one on one side? Or one for each side? I think the... Well, for us, I mean, what I was thinking, it was just one, but I guess it, I don't know, I guess we can make that it's quite well, a distance if you have like a three-year-old. Yeah, but you can pick your seat when you walk on the road. <coughs> Yeah. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in that uh, restroom, you sit on that side. Mm -hmm. Well, our recognition will want to go to City Council and maybe they think we should have two or not. <laughs> maybe better. But I think, I think know, just, just one was the initial idea there. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Um, if there's no other <coughs> concerns, I would take a motion to adjourn. Second. Kirk and John, all in favor? Aye. Uh, all opposed? Meeting is adjourned. Uh, there is a good picture on. This program was brought to you by a cooperation between Newsworks and the City of Eau Claire. A transcript of this meeting is available for the hearing impaired. It will be available within seven days of this telecast. Call 715-839-4912 or TDD 715-839-1689 or write Eau Claire City Clerk, P.O. Box 5148, Eau Claire, Wisconsin 54702-5148.
NewsWorks is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 715-839-5067 or online at valleymediaworks.org.